And we are live. Good morning, Greg. Hey, Mike. How are you? I'm good. I like your map behind the scenes there. Yeah, yeah. I try to, uh, you know, make it look like an official uh, office here. So, you know, it's funny. We have the, a map similar to that, and it's a little disappointing. It cuts off so much of uh, British Columbia. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> you know, you want to tell someone something about, oh, lumber comes from here, and then you're pointing off the map, of course, right? It's funny in that I've had a couple of customers that are uh, uh, in Canada, uh, Eastern and Western, be like, well, wait a second, where's Canada? How, how do you have a picture of uh, North, North America or the U.S.? You don't have Canada there. So, yeah, I, I probably need to uh, get, get a new uh, map here. And I forgot, I, I put on my materials exchange shirt for this call today, and I just looked at myself and I don't have it out, so I have to... Uh... Sorry, I'm undressing on camera. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, lumber's been uh, a little chopped back and forth here right now. It seems like a little consolidation. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting a consolidation in that uh, I, I, I think at the very least, cash continues to move higher, albeit at a slower pace than most people thought. So... You know, we've talked about this now the last couple of weeks, the idea of basis, the difference between cash minus futures, and to have such a wide basis, uh, historically wide basis, as you, again, grind through the month of October, you get the convergence, and that's exactly what we're seeing play out. And I think uh, a lot of people thought that maybe we would be at 650, 675 as far as random length print. Um, we're 625. You have some mills dragging well underneath that 625 print, still in that 610 area. So November uh, is, especially in the past, you know, week over week, and you'll see it on some of these uh, uh, charts, some of these slides. You've had the convergence start to play out, where November is getting pulled down to physical cash now. Uh, all right. Well. Let's get going on it. I love it. Let's talk about what's going on in the future. So this is a chart from the 19th of October. Now, yeah. And so basically a week ago, November was in the $720 area. Okay. Um, if you flip to the next one, we're basically uh, today, November has gotten as low as 644.10. So you're in the 650 area right now. So, you know, you've had a considerable correction week over week in November with cash still bleeding higher. You know, you still have print going, uh, trending upward. Uh, uh, you know, this the same week to week comparison with physical print. We've gone from the 580, 590 area up to 625. So you're still getting appreciation in physical cash. November is collapsing into physical cash now. And so the next chart, Mike, uh, uh, just references that NovJan differential. You know, we talked about the spread relationship, the the difference between November futures and January futures. A week ago, they were somewhere in that 65 to 68. November was trading 65 to 68 under. As of this morning, that spread has collapsed out. Uh, and, and the next check, uh, chart will reference this. That spread's collapsed out to negative $95. So again. That's just November collapsing in to physical cash, November pulling away from January, collapsing away from uh, 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 diverging away from January as it comes into cash. So this chart, this chart shows the price differential between the January contract and the, the November contract and the January contract. Correct. So Correct. For reference, uh, way back here, when was this uh, in May? Late yep. May or late late April, early May, the um, November contract was one hundred and forty dollars higher than the January contract, and today it traded ninety five dollars cheaper or underneath the January contract. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, pretty pretty unbelievable that uh, you, know, you literally can't make this stuff up, and that uh, what a difference. Uh, uh, beginning of the year to the ending of the year and, you know, just, just the massive swings that we've had, uh, you know, which kind of segues into what we're going to talk about here at some point today. 
Sure. You know what? Let's uh, you got a lot of lines drawn on this chart. Let's back up to um, Nov Daily. What what are all these lines here that you have on the chart? So, so these are all different types of technical indicators. Um, you know, there, there's the fundamental analysis of lumber. There's the statistical mathematical analysis of lumber. This is the technical analysis of lumber. And some of these points are moving averages uh, that just take a, uh, uh, bas basically a backwardization, just look at lumber. It's traded, it trades in a certain price range in any given day. You know, so some of these moving aver averages will capture a 20 day moving average, a nine day, a 50 day, a 200 day, 100 day. Uh, the green lines you see there, the red lines are Bollinger Bands. Uh, those Bollinger Bands are basically standard deviations from the mean or the average price of lumber. So one standard deviation, two standard deviations. Uh, again, just different uh, representations of how you, you know, just looking at a graph, uh, a, a visual representation of lumber. And then some of these things, these technical indicators, will kind of give support and resistance indicators of where lumber conceivably could go to either to the upside or the downside. Gotcha. Um, all right. I want to come back to these Bollinger Bands because that plays into a little bit of what we're going to talk about later, which is the volatility. Um, but before we do that, still want to recap where we were between uh, today and last week. So let's grind her down to... Um, the open interest, because that's what we talked about last week. Yeah, Mike, and uh, yeah, before you, if you don't mind, go sure. jump back up. I just want to show the, the basis representation, again, that difference between cash and futures. Uh, so if you go back up to two more slides. Uh, so this is a week ago. We talked about the difference between November futures and physical cash. You, November futures okay. were at $170 premium to physical random length print um, or at random length print was $170 cheaper than yes you. yeah yeah that, that's probably yeah exactly so okay. historically speaking the relationship is that five-year average where futures should be trading at a $20 discount to print so if you look at the next slide here here we are today and the, the collapse has taken place where November now cash is only trading at a $28 discount to November futures. You went from 170 to $28 week over week. So uh, here's what I'm going to say. There's probably a whole lot of wood that is on the ground that is sellable today that wasn't sellable a week ago. Yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, uh, that's a that's a pretty fair statement. And that uh, uh, you know, again, if there was a shortage of wood, then uh, 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 the basis, the, the the convergence between cash and futures would have taken place just the opposite, where you would have seen cash come up to that high price November a week ago. November was seven hundred and twenty dollars. Uh, again, if there was a shortage of wood out there, then physical cash would be somewhere in that six seventy-five to seven hundred dollar area. So you know, we could say the magic forces of the market worked in the last five trading days, or the you know in the yeah. last week. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a pretty. Uh, I agree. I agree. You know, and again, you know, we 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 talked about this the last couple of weeks. The speculative part is I think the market's going up. I think the market's going down. The basis part of it is convergence will take place. I'm not sure which has to, you know, I don't know if cash has to come up, futures has to come down. I'm just looking for that convergence. And so you've had the convergence taken place. So, so as people begin to liquidate the short side of futures here, you definitely begin to see uh, the potential for more secondary wood showing up in physical cash now be, because again the true concept of a basis trade as you liquidate one side you liquidate the other and as you liquidate the futures market had its sell-off it's collapsed into physical cash so as people buy back their shorts and futures they begin to liquidate the physical long side of cash well i'm going to talk out of the other side of my mouth now too uh maybe this isn't happening because Whenever you're looking at a market, 
you can't look at just one thing. It, you have to put everything into context. We do know this happened. The cash market rose or the cash market moved, which was 170 below the futures market. It moved towards the futures market. That happened by cash appreciation and futures depreciation. Here we are today. All right. Can't argue with that. Now, let's talk about the this spread that we looked at earlier. It went from, uh, what was it, about negative $70, $60, $70. Yep. Down to out to negative uh, 95, 90. Now, at a $90 discount from November to January, there's an incentive for a, a basis trader to roll his short position to January and wait. So, you know, at the beginning here, I said, oh, wow, you're probably going to see a lot more wood on the market. Well, some of that wood is just going to get put deeper into the freezer and get pulled out in January because the uh, the basis trader has the opportunity to buy back his short November position and sell it into a January contract at a 90, let's call it, let's say he does it at $80. So now he just picked up $80 of basis compared to his cash position that he has sitting on the ground, the wood that's literally in inventory, that that price never changed. So he was able to move his hedge price from, we'll throw fictitious numbers out there. Let's say he had a $700 sell in futures versus whatever he purchased in cash. He converts that $700 sell to a $780 sell. And uh, they just have to wait for the convergence in January to happen now. No, Mike, and I think that's a great point uh, in that. And, and I know we'll, we'll jump to these next slides, but the open interest uh, uh, when you look at the net change of open interest week over week, that probably is exactly what's happening, more so than all this basis wood flooding the market. I'm sure that there is basis wood out there, but when you look at the open interest structure, uh, you know, we, we've talked about the, the, this concept of historical basis for, uh, you know, basically until blue in the face, but you never really actually saw this massive open increase in open interest to support the idea that there was all this new selling, all, all the guys, you know, people take industry people taking advantage of basis. So when you look at the net change of futures, you're probably off about a hundred contracts week over week. So when you look at the change in November open interest, when you look at the change in January open interest, uh, you, you're seeing November liquidate. You're seeing probably two thirds, if not, uh, uh, you know, upwards of 85, 90 percent of that open interest get moved out of November into January. So I think that, you know, goes to your point that a lot of this wood is just getting, you know, you have to look at it this way. The shorts are being rewarded for being short and that they get to take profits. They get to liquidate November at this low end number. And then they get to roll it and capture this bigger premium in January and still stay long their physical cash where they don't have to do something in cash. If they, if, if they, again, if you have the ability to put the wood on the ground in a reload or in your yard, it, time is still on your side here. You have the ability to sit on that and wait for the convergence to take place between physical cash in January. Now you've captured the basis move in November. So I think that's a great point in the open interest supports that kind of idea. Sure. Um, you know, one of the things I, I tend to look at is I call it smart money. Who, who's been right? So uh, the market had a big down move. The shorts were correct. Um, they're taking their profits and exiting the market and we're seeing open interest fall. Um, now let's jump to the next slide. Oops. And this is the commitment of traders. Um, I think the other one is the one I, I like. Yeah, that. that's, yeah, there you go. Okay. So this is the, uh, oh, it is the long report, but so what, uh, what's going on here? This is, um, October 19th commitment of traders just, report, which was, uh, last Tuesday, this came out on Friday. Uh, what are we seeing here is we're seeing the longs from the producers dropping. Um, but you know what I find interesting, the swap dealers, they uh, added in both the long and the short. 
managed money added in the long. Um, other reportables added long. So it kind of seems like the speculative interest is increasing in the market right now. Yeah, and, and I think part of that is, again, values all in the eye of the beholder. And again, as we get closer and closer into year end, you begin to churn the page in dealing with this year and have to fixate, have to start to think about next year. And I think that's exactly, you know, the idea of swap dealers increasing on both sides. Well, you could have some, you could have the short side there trying to capture this historical basis in the form of, of sawmills trying to capture higher premiums. And then the long side of the equation could be something as simple as, well, I got. I, I might not like the prices. Uh, I don't want to have 100% cash outlay in physical cash, so I've got to start to look at futures regardless of the premium and start thinking about my Q1 needs. So all of the above is probably playing out. Now, uh, something that I want to point out here, and this is going to be a topic for uh, another show, is the influence in the market by the funds. Who are the funds? What are they? Um, one of the things I always look at is what's happening with other commodities, because there yep. are commodity funds out there that buy a basket of commodities. They don't pick and choose. They have a formula and they go, I want to get long commodities. They go in and buy. Uh, right now, you're seeing record highs in, um, in palm oil, in canola oil, in regular oil, <laughs> crude oil. Um, not record highs in crude, but recent highs in crude. Um, you're seeing copper with, uh, you know, really, really high prices. So, uh, at another, another day, we're going to take a look at how other commodities actually influence lumber, irregardless of what the fundamentals are happening inside of the lumber market. Um, but that's for another day. Um, I just think it's, yeah, and, and the one, the one quick thing I'll follow up with that is in a market like a boutique market, like lumber with open interest, uh, uh, as small as it is relative to some of these other commodities, if a commodity if a commodity fund just devotes a one percent allocation uh, of their cash into lumber, that could be a limit type position where you could have a 400, 600, a thousand car position easily in lumber, and it would still be a one percent allocation of their overall portfolio. So that that's kind of the 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 big perspective of the commodity funds: how big they can be in a small market like lumber. Absolutely. So I uh, don't want to steal too much from that, that next topic. And uh, I want to roll into to the topic of today, which is vo volatility. But just before we do that, I want to kind of have everybody think about the things we just talked about. Um, the first thing we talked about was not not overall price, but we talked about that basis relationship. We talked about uh, open interest and we talked about who has the open interest and what they're doing with it. So. We covered three different topics that have really nothing to do with where the actual market is right now. And it's just so important when you're analyzing a market, if you're just looking at absolute price and how that relates to you, you can miss so much of other indicators. So uh, that's what this show is about. It's about teaching you how to look beyond, beyond the screen, beyond just the number that you see or hear in the futures market and uh, look for other indicators to be successful with your trading strategy. So the next topic, volatility. Uh, what is volatility? And I think you've... Uh, yeah, so if you, uh, I think it's slide number 11. There you go. And, and again, I'm not gonna regurgitate uh, what people can read here, but just the general idea of volatility, it's a liability to change rapidly and unpredictably, especially for the worse. Now, I love reading this definition and then applying it to market volatility because the association you have with volatility is it's a negative thing that as something gets more volatile, it creates more negativity. But for the markets, volatility can be a very profitable thing as long as you're on the wrong side of that volatility and you can capture it. So I, I think from a market's perspective, volatility is neither negative or positive it's all 
what side of the volatility are you on? If you're a sawmill and prices go to fifteen hundred dollars, I, I, I think that the volatility worked out pretty well in your favor. If you're on the short side of that equation and you're a jobber selling jobs at five hundred dollars and you cover everything at twelve hundred dollars, then volatility ended up being a very negative thing. But inherently volatility, especially when it comes to the markets, should be seen as a positive thing because it creates opportunity. I, you know what? I have a very good relationship with, I should say, I'm very confident with my relationship with volatility. Yeah. That's because I say volatility just is. It is what it is. And when you have that understanding, um, you can prepare your position or you know however your relationship is with the markets for volatility if you start to assign a um, an emotion to it a positive or a negative then uh, i think you're going to get yourself in trouble absolutely so, absolutely when you enter into uh, a volatility analysis understand it just is and what it is is simply the measurement of the movement now, I'm going to show you some uh, stuff here where vol sometimes markets can move dramatically and actually not be volatile, which is crazy to think that. Um, so I have a chart here and what I'm showing you is the 14 day historic uh, historic volatility for the front month, front month lumber. This is, oh yeah, well here, this is July. So here's what's important to understand. Volatility measures the movement and change from closing price to closing price on a 14 day period. So that movement, the market can go completely sideways and the volatility can be extremely high. The market could move in a straight line direction up or down and the volatility can actually be low. It sounds counterintuitive, but when you just measure the close to close, if you're going sideways, but the movement in the bars is really high. So let's just say Monday, you close limit up. Tuesday, you close limit down. Wednesday, you close limit up. Thursday, you close limit down. Friday, you close limit up. That is an extremely volatile market. And the volatility will measure very high but the movement of the price where you are on the overall scale of up and down could be zero. Now you could also have the market move, uh, you know, a hundred dollars, a thousand over, uh, you know, that same time period. And the volatility would be less because it would go, you know, up 20, up 20, up 20, up 20, up 20. And if you measure that total movement versus the limit up to limit down movement, the limit up limit down movement is actually greater and the whole market didn't move but in greater than the example where it's just going straight up so here's where it represents if you look at this point right here this is um june 11th this year vol went down to 40 percent and it makes sense because if you do a look back of 14 days in these previous 14 days we we didn't move that much. The bars were kind of small up to here. Now, as you see the uh, volatility starting to grow and it uh, you know peaks out right around here, the size of the bars starts to increase and the dramatic change in day-to-day -day pricing becomes significant. The chop is greater. Now, here's that example where volatility stayed high from, um, we'll call it, July, well, here, we'll start here from July 22nd to to August 9th. Volatility stayed fairly high and the price didn't move. It was basically the same price at the end of that period. Yet the volatility stayed high. And that's what it's important to understand. Volatility measures the movement from price, from open to close over the period of um, over a period of time. Yeah, great stuff, Mike. Great stuff. I, I think uh, 
you know, and, and again, the idea of, of measuring, you know, the, the variance is that measure of data from the highs to lows that gives you, you know, uh, they're, they're, you know, when, when you talk about statistical measurements, there are different things that you're trying to measure and you, you have to be careful and, and what am I trying to measure? And just because something has these wide intraday trading ranges or wide intra weekly trading ranges doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get this amplification of the volatility. You can get an amplification of the variance, uh, uh, which is going to measure those peak to valleys in any given day or time period, but not necessarily going to increase the volatility. So, uh, you know, th this is why I, 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 I think in a market like where, where lumber it's critical to understand how volatility can influence, uh, you know, it, it, it just the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, price swings, but just the day, how, how you measure a market like lumber on any given day or any given week. Yep. So let's um, let's just kind of parlay into some strategies around volatility. Uh, we're going to touch on how volatility affects options next week. But uh, let's just talk about how it could affect your day to day thought process with entering and exiting. Um, you'll hear the term, oh, I got so chopped up. And that can happen to you in a high volatile sideways market. It the market gives you false hope and it gives you false um, signals. You know, it'll dramatically move one direction and you think it's ready to break out and you maybe enter or exit a position and then it comes right back down. So. Uh, understanding what the, the current volatility environment is, is important for making your execution decisions. Then, you know, you can have low vol low volatility markets. And this is the one that actually has caught me so much in the past. When a market starts trending and you, you want, like, you want to be short, you think the market's going lower, you want to be short, but you don't want to, you know, be aggressive. And you think that the market will be volatile enough to bounce back up and allow you the opportunity to sell it. And it doesn't. It just grinds lower. Jump, 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 jump. And, and so, I think the uh, the perfect case in point there is November over the last week, Mike, where you've had lower lows and lower highs, where from a vol volatility standpoint, well, we really haven't been doing much of anything. The market had its corrective move. Uh, uh, we've kind of been stuck in this sideways channel. But when you compare November relative to January, you're still seeing a market in November show lower lows and lower highs where January necessarily, okay, it hasn't made new highs, but it necessarily hasn't made lower lows. And that's the whole concept of volatility. When you look at it uh, from a contract to contract standpoint, where the November volatility has played out differently than the January volatility. And that shows itself in that differential between Nov and Jan and then the basis between cash and futures. Absolutely. Yep. Here, here's what you're talking about. This is just this little light grind lower that we've experienced in the last uh, five or six trading days. And I'm and, sorry, is that that's uh, November, Mike? Yeah, this is November. Yeah. So if you can pull up, if you have uh, uh, access to a January, just show that, that same movement in January um and you know in november you have the lower lows lower high scenario and then when you pull up the january uh let's see here uh, let me go back to oh, i'll just pull it up here by the way if anyone wants a uh, a nice spot to look at charts bar chart is an excellent place and it's free yeah, no, bar chart is uh, uh, yeah, here you good go. stuff. Uh, there you go. So there, there's that January. So uh, you almost have the opposite scenario before today where you've had this slightly higher high, higher low scenario. Uh, and it, again, it's not necessarily going to be reflected uh, uh, per se on the close as much as those intraday moves, you know, slightly higher high, slightly lower or higher lows just the opposite of November. And that explains when you combine that November minus the January, that gives you that bleed out from negative $68 out to negative $95. It wasn't all November giving it all back to the downside. There's some January bleeding higher or at least sideways 
November, giving it back to the downside to push that spread differential out. Yeah, you know, this. I'm so glad we pulled this chart up. I'm going to zoom in. You can see how the volatility from at this point, if you look at the size of the bars and the difference between the highs and lows and close, it's pretty dramatic and it's measured in the volatility being higher. Now we come down here to this low point and, you know, where the volatility stayed rather low. If we zoom out, what you're going to see is, sure enough, the opens and closes tended to be in the, very close to this this line, like right here. And it's reflected in the, the low volatility. So, all right, we're coming up on 30 minutes. That's the end of the show here. But I want to highlight something we're going to look at next week, which is um, options and how volatility affects them. So today, there's an option strategy or um, uh, uh, spread is called a, the straddle. And it is where you either buy or sell. So if you buy this, the straddle, you buy um, the put and the call at the same strike. So this morning, the $650 straddle. So if you wanted to buy a call, 650 call and buy a 650 put, you could do that for around 18 and a half dollars. I'm sorry, 28 and a half dollars. They were both selling. This is when when futures was trading at 650. You could buy the put and the call for about 28 bucks. So for that, if you did that, what you would need the futures market to do would be to move either $28 higher or lower to make that position profitable. Basically, the guy, whoever was selling that was saying, I don't think that the futures market is going to move much beyond the 650 range in the next four trading days because options expire on Friday. Um, the difference in where option pricing was on Monday compared to today in just one day, um, the volatility price on my screen showed that should have been trading at about $36 and it was trading at 20. They, they, they chose to trade it at 28. So it's just saying that they thought volatility was going to be low over the next four trading days. Anyway, we're going to cover that next. Um, Greg, great talk today. Uh, I know uh, volatility can be a complex topic, but uh, I think it's really important to understand what it is and what it means to you. But if if there's one takeaway, volatility just is what it is. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a great uh, point, Mike. And I think next week, delving into option volatility, for those that are interested in trading futures but don't necessarily want the outright exposure, this will be a phenomenal uh, uh, look at some strategies to capture volatility or impending volatility or to capture a, a, a non-volatile market without having the market exposure. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm truly looking forward, uh, especially in talking to somebody that's an option expert uh, and talking about option volatility next week. Yep, sounds good. All right, so uh, anyone uh, has any questions uh, during the week, fire Matt Gregg. He's more than happy to answer him. Send him over to me. Um, if, uh, you know, good luck, be safe out there, and uh, we'll talk to everybody next Tuesday. Thanks a lot, Greg. Thanks a lot, Mike. I appreciate it. Have a great day. You too.